Hey, welcome to the Clive Barker Podcast. This is episode 60. Uh, it's hard to believe we've made it through 60 episodes already. We're probably going to have maybe one uh, one or maybe two more episodes uh, for this year, and then we're going to start into 2014. Uh, so anyway, episode 60 was about the adventures of Maximilian Bacchus and his traveling circus. Uh, this was, a, you know, we, we get into it, but it was a book written by Clive Barker in 1974-1975. Uh, really, really cool, uh, fantastical kind of a book. Um, really interesting, uh, predates, of course, the Books of Blood and anything else that was published. Um, uh, it was just Jose and I here on this episode 60, so, yep, enjoy. Did we get any, like, feedback for uh, today's well, episode? Almost all the comments were like, oh, I meant to read that, but I haven't read it yet. Hmm. Okay. Actually, every comment was like that, except that we have one comment where they were actually asking questions. All the hmm. other ones were like, oh, I have that book, but I haven't read it yet. Well, geez, gosh. I mean, that, I that's, actually a pretty, that's actually a pretty good book, and it reads yeah. really quickly, so... yeah. Oh, they're missing out. I mean, yeah. it's not Aberat or anything where you have to, like, wait for, like, years until you can read the next part. And it's a quick read. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we can go straight into the news then. Um, okay. In site news, we just uh, – we, there's a, a redesign of the website. I There were some limitations on the theme, the WordPress theme that I had, so I wanted to uh, – I shopped around and looked for one that I thought would, would fit better what, what I wanted, you know, and, and uh, so – I wanted more links across the top, and and uh, and I wanted to be able to show more stories, um, and ha and be able to customize a little better. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I love the uh, I love the the new design for the Clive Barker Cast website. Um, there's also something that was changed. I I'm not I, I'm sure you meant to do that. It's the little icon that appears on the address bar in the browser uh, when we open the website. Yeah. Now we see uh, a little image of uh, Pinhead from the banner that oh, Mark yeah. Matt yeah. Harpole uh, came up with. I That's did pretty that. cool. Um, I can't see it on my own because it's like those those fav icons. They yeah, seem to yeah. stay in your in your browser history forever. Oh, okay. So it's really hard to it's really hard to reset them in there. I guess I could just reset Safari and then that would work. Well, like, yeah. Clear everything. It's a nice detail, though. I mean, I always, I always enjoyed uh, opening a website and having the little fav icon in the address <laughs> bar. Be like, you know, either, uh, either it's uh, the, the the Clyde Barker Revelations CB thing on a oh, blue yeah. background, or it's like uh, Pandora has a little P on it. So, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but I love, I love the new design. I think, I think people have loved the new design as well. Uh, well, cool. You know. It's it's very clean and uh, streamlined, and uh, it works well with the images and stuff. So yeah, yeah. So check it out. It's CliveBarkerCast dot com. Um, then and oh, Andrew Andrew Cop the he he's been doing uh, retro comic reviews of Clive Barker related comic books, and yeah, he, since our last episode, he's done Nightbreed number six and Nightbreed number seven. Yeah, he's been doing a great job. Uh, yeah. He he posts like uh, great reviews of of the Nightbreed comics, and uh, it's really a pleasure to read them. It's yeah. like uh, it's like going back and remembering all those comics that you used to read. And and he's doing them in uh, chronological order. So sometimes he's doing Night Hellraiser, and sometimes he's doing Nightbreed comics. And that there's a there's a great news today uh well not today but there's since the last episode there's a, a, a bombastic you know uh bombshell news about uh seraphim and uh clive barker books right oh yeah yeah right right so yep yeah, that was next down on the list 
Um, so Seraphim is self-publishing uh, First Tales, which mm-hmm. has uh, which has Candle in the Cloud, and um, and that's the big one because Candle in the Cloud has never been published before. Yeah, it's a little novella. Yeah, um, it has Candle in the Cloud, and it also has uh, the, the Wood on the, the Hill. Wood on the Hill, which has been published in uh, in. Clive Douglas Winter's uh, The Dark Fantastic yeah. the biography. Yeah. yeah. That's where I read it first. Uh, yeah, me too. And we actually talked about it on Rare Stories. Mm-hmm. Um, in our Rare Story, one of our Rare Stories episodes. But yeah, so Wood on the Hill, I mean, it's good to see it in a Clive Barker book instead of a biography uh, because then it'll, it'll go out to more of the people that are just looking to read his stories. Uh, but the biggest part of the biggest news is obviously is Candle in the Cloud. It's previously unpublished. Yeah, and Clyde Barker wrote these stories when he was like twelve and seventeen, right? I think yeah, I think Candle in the Cloud, you're right, I think was like seventeen years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um so and and Maximilian Bacchus that we're gonna be talking about today is another old story. Uh not that old, but it's but it's it's up there. Um so awesome, yeah. Uh, in addition to that, so and that's self-published by uh, it's their inaugural work, uh, Seraphim Inc. It's like all one word, Seraphim with a capital I, Inc. And this was, is their first book. There's a lettered uh, a lettered um, copy. Uh, there's a, and there's a trade, and you can buy posters. And there's an uh, there's an audio book. And I yeah, think, gosh, the, there's a lot of formats for this for this book. Yeah, and they went they they were first available at midnight, I believe, uh, midnight after Thanksgiving. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's for pre-order. Uh, so they'll be out in on in February. Absolutely, I, I I'm looking forward to pre-ordering this this book. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be amazing. You can actually uh, uh, download. An audiobook for free yeah. from the real dot com store. You can go there, check it out. It's uh, it's one of their main you know books that's featured there. Uh, there's a lot of concept art for the book, um, and you can see what the poster looks like, what the hardcover is going to look yeah. like. There's going to be letters, lettered hardcovers. There's going to be um, tr- trade paperback. There's there's going to be all sorts of like versions, according to how much you want to spend on this. I think the most expensive one is like five hundred dollars. Yeah. But that includes an actual original sketch by Clyde Barker inside the book. So considering Clyde Barker artwork goes for usually like three hundred dollars or four hundred dollars in yeah. a small sketch in a piece of paper, then uh, that that makes absolute sense. Yeah. So that's. Uh, five five hundred, or with an unsigned poster, five fifteen, or with a side signed poster, five forty five, for that one, and that comes in a in a tray case. And, and then, ultimately, the, the the cheapest one is how much? Uh, forty five. There you go. Yeah, the, and so then the the middle one is the limited, which is three hundred and fifty signed copies, not lettered, uh, but numbered, obviously, and that's one twenty five, and then the trade is forty five. That's the one that yeah. I got. I got the trade hardcover. Yeah, you guys got to keep in mind that this is this is a, a self-published book, yeah. so it's the first p- book that Seraphim's going to self-publish. Yeah. And uh, as such, uh, it's always it's always going to be more expensive than mm-hmm. uh, than a book published by a huge uh, you know publishing company that has all the mechanisms put in place to make books as cheaply as possible. So, um, but it's going to, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see, um, what comes out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Well, and, and I think everyone should buy it, you know, because we want to see Seraphim Inc. become successful. Uh, if they are, then we'll start seeing a lot more stuff get published more quickly. Things that have been kind of sitting around in Clive's office for years. Sure. Who knows? Maybe yeah. they can. Maybe they can do that whole uh, poetry volume, self-published, or even like a short story volume that we've been promised for so many years. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That'd be nice. There'd be nothing yeah. to stop them. Of course. Yeah. Then there's no publisher saying, "Yeah, nobody wants to buy a book of short stories." Yeah, and it would. You know, it. The beauty of these 
new indie publishers and uh, and and self, the the world of self publishing nowadays on the the days of the internet, the days where you can like do quick start kickstarters and you know just go online and have the the author talk directly to his readers and stuff like that that we see today that's the beauty of it is that nowadays if an author has a connection to his fans and if he wants to publish something directly to his fans he could do it without having to have middlemen in the middle yeah you know i mean it, it, 20 years ago this probably would not be uh, easy to do i yeah. mean if someone wanted to do that they would probably have to like <laughs> come up with like a, a you know a pdf or a copy or something or a word yeah. document that people would have to print nowadays it's much easier nowadays there's all sorts of mechanisms put in place that can allow small presses to actually print out books and mail them from the author directly to the readers yeah. which is a beautiful thing uh and then the next thing leviathan the story story of hellraiser and hellbound hellraiser 2 that's a really long title but this is a documentary that's being put together about hellraiser and hellraiser 2 um, we've been seeing little little hints and updates uh, from some of the actors uh, from those movies, um, Nicholas Vince and Simon Bamford, and mm -hmm. Barbie. Wilde. Oliver Parker, yeah, and yeah. Oliver Parker was being uh, interviewed uh, recently as well. They posted oh, cool. pictures of Oliver Parker, the guy who plays the Moving Man on, yeah. uh, on uh, Moving Man One, I think, on uh, Hellraiser, and he also plays uh, Peliquin in Nightbreed. So yeah, they've. They got a bunch of people. Yeah, yeah. So that's really cool. Hopefully, they'll interview Clive Barker as well, and and uh... that'd be nice. Yeah. I, I have a feeling that these people are uh, based in England, though. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know uh, to what extent they'll be able to uh, to right, uh, right. interview Clive. But let's see what what happens. Who knows? Yeah. And we don't know. We don't know when this is going to come out. Uh, we just know that it's being worked on and and promoted. Uh, right. Yeah, now. yeah. So that's cool. Um, there's a new edition of the Damnation game, which that sort of came out of nowhere. I didn't. I don't think any of us expected that, but um, mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. It's a limited edition. Uh, it's as we're saying this, it may be sold out. Um, they've been selling out really fast. It's got a really cool, interesting kind of a cover of like a, a guy with a big like his back is split open. It's really strange looking, but looks like a woman to me but it, it might be yeah, an androgynous be figure yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and it's published by cemetery dance yeah i i didn't know about this uh, honestly until you pointed it out to me uh, earlier in the week and uh, i was like oh look at that that's actually a really nice cover and it's nice to see the damnation game get like a new breath of life because yeah. i think it's it's an underrated uh, book in the Clive Barker bibliography, and and honestly, I don't think it's been reprinted very often. I mean, it le well, I guess it has in paperback, but we haven't seen a, a hardcover since the '85, you know, first edition. Yeah, I I never saw a hardcover myself. I mean, I only have a paperback to be honest. Oh really? Yeah, I have the yeah. I have the U.S. hardcover, which ah. has a kind of a goofy picture on it. But um, but yeah, I mean, this is a nicer edition than the one that I have, but. But you know, I don't know if I if I can afford to buy this. Oh yeah, I'm looking at our website, and I just noticed that you got yourself an avatar picture of uh, a crab. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, it's Emmett. Yeah, that's the the that's uh, WordPress has decided that whenever I log into a WordPress blog, that's what my avatar is. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So yeah, but there's really a bunch of like stuff that's coming out uh, from Clyde Barker, and you you created this little widget on the upcoming releases on the right side of the website um, that you can see. Uh, 2014, you have a list of books that are supposed to come out, and not just books. Like the Nightbreed uh, director's cut is also there. Yeah, I thought it'd be kind of cool to put everything that's Clive Barker related on there. Uh, if it if it's incomplete, you know, which it probably is, let us know. We'll we'll add stuff on there. Yeah. Um and then uh, I I think that that probably Scarlet Gospels and Aberat 4 have a chance of squeaking in in 2014, but we don't really know for sure. And then some of these other ones Tortured Souls I think for sure is probably going to be in 2014, but they didn't give us a date, so I just put it in the near future section. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what's what's going to happen also to that uh Zombies with Zombies, I'm sorry. Blah, blah, blah. Zombies vs. Gladiators movie yeah. that Clyde Barker is supposed to be involved with. Yeah. I just got a message from Amazon the other day, 
and it was telling me, uh, watch new pitch videos from Amazon Studios. So they were telling me that uh, Amazon Studios was like, uh, you know, apparently it's it's restructuring itself a little bit. So now it it has a, a slightly different uh, website. It's promoting its projects a little more, but I, I didn't see anything there about zombies yeah. versus gladiators. And I, and I wonder if movies that they make are going to skip the theater and, and go straight to Amazon streaming. It's possible. Kind of like TV shows on Netflix. Yeah, it could show up instantly on Amazon, Amazon, Amazon Prime, Prime Instant Video. Yeah. yeah, who knows? Yeah, well, that'd be interesting. We'll have to wait and see, or maybe they'll deliver it to you with robots, <laughs> flying robots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a crazy story that you pointed out. Prime right? Air. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, next thing. Um, actually, oh yeah, Boom Studios Hellraiser number ten uh, just came out. So. Uh, what, actually, in our last episode, uh, Ben Mears had already talked about it. It had just come out. But for me, it came out um, on Wednesday, you know, just three days ago because I'm in Alaska. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the comic right now, actually. I got it here on my desk. It's got a cool uh, cover of uh, with a picture of... of um, a female Cenobite. Yeah. yeah, she's holding up the box. And the, the war against Abaddon yeah. or Abaddon mm -hmm. continues. And uh, yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't had a chance to read it yet uh, completely, but um, it, it looks. I've been looking at the artwork inside. Pretty cool. I, I did read it. Let me. I'm gonna take a look again. I think. Oh yeah, yeah, right. There's kind of a big revelation in there about the the nature of 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 Abaddon's plans and. Ah. But, uh, no spoilers. And it, and it ends with a cliffhanger, of course. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah, so definitely check that one out. Um, and I think that's it for news, unless there's anything else. Anything else that you can think of? Hmm. Uh, well, not really. So I think I think that's it for, for this episode uh, okay. regarding Clyde Barker-related news. All right. So obviously our main topic is Maximilian Bacchus and his traveling circus. Uh, this yes. was originally written in 1974-1975, but first published in 2009 by Bad Moon Books. Yeah. Um, Clyde Barker uh, revealed once in 2009 uh, on the Liverpool Lives uh, article. Um, actually, the, the Liverpool Lives uh, section of the book, Memory, Prophecy, and Fantasy, oh, Volume yeah, yeah. 1. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was talking about uh, how he wrote the book and he said he was influenced by the stories of Lord Dunsany with a willful use of fantastic names. Um, <laughs> so he says that Ophelia, the ballerina, had a little of Ann Taylor who wanted to be a ballerina. And the perfect prince was Graham Bickley, who was just the most beautiful of people, a wonderful looking 18 year old. And he says, I was Bacchus, the ringmaster. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's it's interesting that the book that uh, was released by Bad Moon uh, had artwork inside from Richard T. Kirk, who yeah. people will remember from uh, other illustrated editions of Clyde Barker's work, like Imagica. Yeah, the the paperback Imagica that's broken into two parts. Right, yeah. and didn't he also do something for Weave World? Uh, oh, the twenty fifth anniversary Weave World. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. His artwork is amazing, and I, I think I remember he also made like some. Artwork for uh, uh, Imagica cards, trading cards, or am I wrong? Because I don't have that. Uh, there's a lot I, of different artists for that. I can't remember right. if he did or not. I'd right. have to take a look. Right. I guess I might be confusing with the artwork that he did for Imagica. Well, it's possible. But, I, I mean, that's that's very possible. I'm gonna have to go back and look. And I do want to remind people that I, there's only like seven cards that I'm missing. So if any, there's anyone out there that wants to trade with me. I'll be very generous because I have tons and tons and tons of extra cards to trade. So yeah. if anyone wants to complete their collection, I could probably help you a lot. Uh, if you just if you just have a couple that I need, I need like six. Um, so so uh, I think uh, he published this book uh, a little bit under influence from Phil and Sarah Stokes, I think, uh, or at least they were like. They're like his official archivists, and they were like working on this stuff, and they were like, "Oh, you know, this would be probably a good idea." And he actually he mentions that in the uh, beginning of the uh, the opening of the book. There's like yeah. forward. Yeah, and in, uh, in his forward, he, he says he's he he kind of hints that he was caught in a lie that he was he wrote an original introduction that 
wasn't quite true or Phil and Sarah had kind of caught him that he said some things that weren't quite true. So he was sort of, you know, uh, abusing <laughs> himself and saying, okay, you know. Yeah. And um, he he did specify, again, uh, in uh, an interview with Phil and Sarah that – he has not really changed the story ever since he wrote it, that he said he just corrected some grammatical errors and spellings and whatever, mm -hmm. but he's done nothing at all to the text itself. So this is pretty cool when you read it. It, yeah. it, it shows, you know, the talent of Clyde Barker, even when you're reading his juvenilia, uh, yeah. it, it, the talent is obvious there. Yeah. And, you know, so. And, uh, and it's, it's, the, it's, got, it's full of flourishes and, and uh, crazy stuff. The, the titles of the chapters, which are really not chapters, they're really like sections or little... Uh, these sections are almost independent stories uh, of themselves, in and of themselves, but like the, the, the chapter title headings are really long titles. Like the first one is uh, The Wedding of Indigo Murphy to the Duke Lorenzo de' Medici on and How Angelo Was Discovered in an Orchard. Yeah. Yeah, it, it goes like... Um... Like those old, like, Victorian novels that yeah. we would read, like old Victorian, uh, what do they call them? The things that they would put on the string, on a stand in the street, they would just pick it up. And it would be Varney the Vampire, and it says, how Varney the Vampire was caught sucking the blood of Duke, blah, 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 and, you know. <laughs> like, um, it, it reminds me of that kind of, like, stories. Like he said, like the Lord Dunsany stories, so mm -hmm. I guess that was a tradition that there was a little, a little synopsis of what happens yeah in the chapter so people would know oh i haven't read this chapter yet yeah so yeah and and the the characters are are uh it's the the these stories are are fantastic because animals you can talk people can talk with animals it seems like it's set in maybe the i don't know maybe like the 13th or 14th century it's hard to tell for sure but hey uh, I, I think, you know, he mixes in a lot of references, like he mixes in characters who spoke to Ramses II yeah. and uh, uh, Kublai Khan as a character yeah. in, in yeah. this and, uh, you know, other other people who are mixed together from different time periods who would never really meet. Yeah. So it's a fantastical realm. It, yeah. It's not it's not meant to be take place in any specific time period uh, it's 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 fantastical but it's not a coherent fantastic like he does with aberat where he creates a world with distinct like uh or or the magicas fifth Domi five dominions this is more like a fairy tale slash what's the word i'm trying to come up with uh it, it's 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 more like a fairy tale really oh, yeah. like a legend like like someone writing a a, a a oh, fable. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a fable. Yeah, it's more like a mean. fable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of like a bard's tale of these characters, in a way. Yeah, it's it's more like a fable. Yeah. So, um, it opens... yeah. It's... Go ahead. No, I was going to say that they're really uh, very, you know, over-the-top characters, uh, very fantastic and uh, almost like cartoonish. Yeah. It opens with we're said saying goodbye to one of the characters to uh, Indigo Murphy, who was the bird girl. Uh, mm -hmm. She had a bird act, which we don't really know exactly what it is. But what's cool is there, you know, there are regular a lot of regular birds that she has, but she also has an Archaeopteryx, which is a, di yeah. a dinosaur. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so there you go. Cool. Yeah, so they're yeah. all they're all sitting around at the table after the wedding is over, and and this they're at the reception. And uh, she wants to say goodbye to her birds, and they start going nuts. And and the Ar Archaeopteryx grabs a candelabra and sets fire to the to the dinner table. Yeah, and then <laughs> you know the wedding is is destroyed, and yeah. <laughs> uh, all of a sudden people start hearing the chuckle, and it's Mr. Bacchus. He's chuckling in the back. Yeah. And I always get this feeling that Mr. Bacchus, and here Clive isn't being like subtle at all. I mean, he yeah. mentions Bacchus having like leaves in his beard and his hair. He's yeah. basically Bacchus from the Greek mythology. I mean, yeah. yeah well, uh, and he's, he mentions, you know, this. There's one point where he mentions that this other uh, Josebiah Bentham has been his enemy, arch enemy for centuries. Yeah, with yeah. a theater of tears. Yeah. yeah. But this character, Clive, usually draws these uh, rubicund, uh, fat, bearded, uh, very, you know, yeah. imposing characters sometimes. 
like uh, you know, I, I mean, Maximilian Bacchus and L- Lemuel Lowe from Weave World. Yeah. They're like two characters that merge together in my mind every time I'm reading yeah. this. It's like the guy who has the orchard, and he has like this theater there, and people just go there and dance and yeah. do performance art, and it's like a kind of archetype that he creates for his story it's sometimes true, yeah it's, it's kind of kind a of fat guy bearded very ringmaster you know, type yeah yeah ringmaster yeah and, and in fact clive uh did mention that he himself thought of himself as maximilian Bacchus sometimes yeah. and you do have those little uh snippets whenever there was a play that was being uh made in school mm-hmm. and uh clive would take the initiative and he would like strap a rope around like uh i don't i'm not i'm not sure if it was phil rimmer or if it was, if it was peter atkins no it wasn't peter atkins because he met him later but he would tie a rope around like one of his uh, fellow actors and he would like make him up to look like an, uh, a troll or something and then he would walk <laughs> into the classrooms and say come watch our play you know and then he would just pull the rope and the other guy would go limping behind him like snarling <laughs> so that that that's you know yeah. Actually, here it is. Here it is. Uh, Pete Atkins once said to Douglas E. Winter, um, it was an idealized wish of what the theater of imagination might become. Clive thought he was Maximilian Bacchus, and we were his traveling circus. Although in the illustrations, Max looked more like Phil Rimmer, and Josebiah Bentham, the villain, looked like Clive. So this <laughs> this is uh, uh, Peter Atkins talking to Douglas E. Winter in The Dark Fantastic about uh, the theater of the imagination and uh, the early, you know, in, Things that Clyde Barker would pick up from uh, his old uh, 17 or 18 year old tale of Maximilian Bacchus. Yeah. And and the, the characters are, are interesting. So we've got uh, Indigo Murphy that we just talked about. Uh, Hieronymus is the strong man. Uh, and uh-huh. he's sort of a he man, right? Like his strength is can't be measured. Uh, yeah. Ophelia... Hieronymus or, or hero, like they call yeah. him in the rest of the book. And, and Ophelia is the trapeze girl. Uh-huh. Uh, and she's emotional. She cries all the time. Yeah, I, I visualize her as kind of like a woman in a tutu, like a ballerina. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and my favorite is Malachi, the opera singing crocodile. Uh, yeah. He, he's such a downer, and, and you would think be, being a crocodile that he would protect them, but he, he gets scared every time there's a problem. And he's always uh, he's always saying negative stuff. Um, yeah, I, I I always imagine him as the other characters I can see as like realistic kind of characters, but but for some reason Malachi for me is always like a cartoon crocodile, <laughs> yeah. like walking on his back legs, yeah, and uh, yeah with a little hat on or something yeah, like that. And everybody calls him like Leviathan or Worm or Serpent. Yeah, yeah, because his ancestors were supposed to be dragons. Yeah, <laughs> that's like what he, he reveals that. Yeah, he reveals that at one point, and 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 some old, fantastic and Dungeons and Dragons stuff. Dragons are also referred as worms, right? Yeah. With a Y. Yeah. So yeah. And then of course Domingo de Iberondo, the clown, and you've you've mentioned in the past uh, his where that name came from. Um, yeah, and Clyde Barker also uh, goes almost verbatim. Yeah. On the whole story of how he uh, came up with the name the that he was walking on Liverpool. Yeah, in the introduction. Yeah. So he does confess that in this book. I forgot about that part. I guess I missed the introduction uh, when I read the book. But he does mention that he really loved the name. He had no idea who the guy was or what he did. But apparently someone else on Flickr found that out, like found some story about the, this guy. And, and the, um, the, the real story of what the guy did is not quite as exciting as – you know, <laughs> no, you he was not a clown that rose over the moon yeah. and belonged to a fantastic circus. Yeah. But I guess he kind of took that name and he really went with it. And he does mention again in the introduction how when he made the uh, epigraph for the chapter in uh, Nightbreed, uh, We Are All Imaginary Animals, that yeah. some critics actually said, yes, yes, that's a very fine quote to open the chapter because <laughs> yeah. you know, and yeah. they would say that they have read the book, the, the, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Domingo de Barondo's book, yeah. The Bestiary of the uh, Subconscious, I think. I don't know. Yeah, beast, yeah. Bestiary of... I can't remember. So, yeah, it, yeah. it's... he He's like, somewhere a clown is laughing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, Maximilian Bacchus, and you described him already. He's also got a, a walking stick that sprouts flowers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and his circus cart, it's not really a cart, it's a caravan, I guess. Uh, and it's pulled by a giant ibis bird named Thoth. Yeah, it's kind of an Egyptian name. It makes sense because 
the ibis birds were important in Egypt as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's interesting. And then there's this exact counterpart to his uh, circus, Maximilian Bacchus Circus, which is the Circus of Tears. And uh, there's the villain, which honestly is not much of a villain. He's pretty easy to, to, to fool. Yeah. But uh, yeah. he had like uh, like he has like a clown that is like the opposite of Domingo de Borondo is like – uh, the silver clown. He's got a hook for a hand, and, and it's he like jugg- little, he juggles he looks... like broken shards of glass. Or yeah, <laughs> and and instead of having like a crocodile, they have like a blind snake woman. Yeah, uh, and it, it, there, there's an orangutan instead of a strong man. Yeah, uh, and it's really cool. He makes this like this this exact opposite of Maximilian Bar- Barcus's circus called yeah. the Circus of Tears. And while Maximilian Barcus wants to make people feel good. The Circus of Tears leaves melancholy and it makes people cry wherever they go. <laughs> yeah. Which makes me wonder, how the hell did they get paid for that? <laughs> yeah, do people want their money back? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the the story kind of the the uh, after the wedding they they head out they they head out and they sort of in the in the sort of the tradition of of knights, you know, whenever they see something is wrong Everybody has to stop and solve whatever that problem is before they can go back on to their original quest again. Mm-hmm. And so in here we have a, a an orchard, and there's a thief that had stolen a bunch of fruit from the orchard, and the owners are chasing him. Uh, and his name is Angelo, right, the thief? Yeah. Yeah, and then, then the guy catches him, and he's going to teach him a lesson, and of course Box intervenes and says, hey, you know, that... The kid just tripped and fell, and he's kind of unconscious, and you know you, you can't hit someone who's down. Yeah. And uh, and then a, the fruit. and and, uh, and he'll pay for the fruit. And then it's like something happens. The farmer's wife shows up and says, "Oh, our little lady is our little daughter is gone. She went into the forest, which is a really, yeah. uh, really scary forest. It's got tigers and whatever." And baboons. And in one page it says there's mandrills, and then another page says there's baboons. But um, uh, I always thought that it was, was – wouldn't it be cool if, like, this wood that's supposed to have, like, these monsters and it's haunted could be, like, the wood on the hill from the story <laughs> yeah. with, the, with the, the, the duchess or baroness or yeah. whatever? Yeah, that is cool. uh, Yeah, because I, I those – I totally see that, too. I mean, they, they – this seems like that same un- kind of universe that that uh, the wood on the hill would exist in. Exactly, doesn't and it? I mean, he wrote that the at the clouds, same time. Yeah. yeah, I haven't I haven't had a chance to read the Candle in the Cloud. But we've read a lot of excerpts from it from Phil and Sarah's books. Sure, yeah. yeah. But uh, looking forward to uh, hearing the whole thing and then yeah. buying the book. Again, people, there's a free audio book download at realclybarker dot com. So if you go there, you can listen to the book first, and then you can buy it and read it later. Yeah. Uh, but it, it seemed to me like because these stories were written around the same time, more or less, mm-hmm. uh, that already at that time, Clyde Barker had this coherent universe that he was creating mm-hmm. uh, with these little fables. Um, yeah. But wouldn't it be nice if that was the same wood? That's basically what I was trying to say. Yeah, and, and, and I could definitely see that. Um, and, and wood and trees were really important to him. Uh, there was a time in his childhood when they had a tree in the backyard and his parents decided to cut it down. Oh. And that was really traumatic for him. That, that was something that I had remembered from Phil and Sarah's book. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're going to be plugging their books a lot because if you want to know about Clive Barker, there's no better source. I mean, these go into so much detail. Yeah, the memory, prophecy, and fantasy yeah. books. Uh, and, and there are two right now that you can get from them from their website. I think they're still available. Uh, and and yeah. then number three is going to be coming out sometime in the near future. I hope they're still available. I'm not sure about the first one. You know, if yeah, you guys get a copy, you need to hurry up. Yeah. But um, – so so yes so the the daughter of the farmer disappears yeah, into yeah. the woods and, and we discovered that uh, this this guy this this fruit thief he has a certain a certain power. Yes, they Angel all go has, into the woods to find her, and they kind of they hear something, and they kind of all everybody runs away except Angelo. Uh, yeah, he he uh, he's just standing there like they're like Angelo, get back! You're gonna get eaten by a tiger. Yeah, and and uh, it turns out that. I don't know if you want to get into spoilers into this or if we should just like go I, yeah, a little. I was thinking about that because it, it sort of uh, made me think that 
we maybe we shouldn't spoil it because yeah. so many people made comments on Facebook that they haven't read this book yet. It's like a lot, yeah. there's a lot of people out there that bought it when it came out and then just didn't get around to reading it. Well, we'll say that he has a certain power yeah. and that he manages to redeem himself from sealing the fruits because he uses his power to rescue the farmer's daughter. Yeah. And after that, he joins a circus. He joins a circus and he goes to the, with them. Uh, well, the thing is, they reach a crossroads at one point and, and they, they, they try to decide which way to go. So they know that one side will go to, uh, what was the place? It was like some English uh, town. Uh, uh, here it is. Uh, oh, yeah, right. And, and, yeah, it's, and they it's really see, funny. And they see Marco Polo sitting there at the crossroads. There we go. Sitting yeah, one dirt. of the. <laughs> it's funny because again, this is like what you can expect from the story is yeah. that one of the sides of the crossroads lead to the Galapagos. The road <laughs> straight ahead led to Glastonbury, <laughs> yeah. and then the other road was a mystery. Yeah, so and it there ends you go. Up going into China, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to to uh, Xanadu. Yeah. Where the great Kublai Khan resides. I'm not even sure if that's historically accurate. Of course, it's not. Well, I think Kublai Khan is a fictional character, right? From um, from uh, Blake. Uh, I, I. That's a good question. I, I thought he was a uh, Mongolian. I think he yeah. was a real. He was a real uh, emperor of the Mongol Empire. I think. Hmm. Uh, wasn't there a Kublai Khan and there was like another another guy? Uh, There's Genghis Khan and I, Genghis Khan yeah. and Kublai, Khan. right? Yeah, no, they were they were historical uh, characters. I think I'm gonna look him up. Yeah. Um. But but anyway, so they decide. Okay, well, let's go to let's go to Asia. Let's go to Xanadu because if we make it big there, we're gonna make it big everywhere because this emperor has really a lot of power and uh, this city is like. I guess it's like the Paris of this universe. If you go there and you you become famous in Paris, you become famous worldwide. Uh, oh, he's so, the grandson of Genghis Khan. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So you're right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. He was, I he, thought he was a fictional mem, you know, fictional emperor. I didn't know he was real. Well, I'm sure he was used in a lot of fictional poetry and then uh, yeah. prose. So I could see where you were coming from, but. Um, so yeah, they decide to go to Xanadu, and the trip is not without its perils. Yeah. Of course, they come across uh, one night. They come across uh, a noise on the top of their cart. And, and the, the title of this is great. It's the face of the flying lionfish, and why Doctor Josephiah Bentham's Theater of Tears sailed north. <laughs> that just rolls off your tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, and the the funny part is of that is that the, there are no flying lionfish. Uh, they just, yeah, obviously. They just, yeah, there's these noises in their cart while they're trying to sleep, banging, and something's up on the roof. And Malachi gets scared and hides in the basket of clothes, of costumes. And 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 and, uh, and Malachi comes up, starts coming up with ideas about what's up there, and he says there that might be a lionfish. But I think he's making it up. <laughs> yeah. Even inside the story, even inside the fantastic universe, yeah. I think. He's making it up, so there are no lionfish. But one of the things that I that I thought about this was uh, they call the guy from the Theater of Tears, Josebiah Bentham. Mm -hmm, yeah. And he's supposed to be this guy is really melancholy. He's a bit of a, you know, he's a bit of a downer. And he dresses like in all like gray clothes and he has like a silver cane. And the name kind of rung something on my mind and i and i looked it up and there was no josephia bentham but there was a jeremy bentham which was a british philosopher and i wonder i wonder if this has anything to do with uh, i wonder if this was any inspiration for the name of this guy because jeremy bentham was a british philosopher a jurist and a social reformer and the founder of modern utilitarianism well you know i and, i would think yes because uh, Clive Barker would have been 21 or 22 when he was writing this. Right. And he, so he would have been right in the middle of college where he was a philosophy major. Right. So that, that may have yeah. somehow, I don't know, this is just my speculation, but yeah. that may have been where he got some ideas for this character or the name at least. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I think so. That's a good point. Um, and th th there's a, there's a, a depiction of Dr. Josephia Bentham, 
uh, drawn by Clive Barker uh, mm-hmm. on clivebarker.info. I'm going to send this to you so we can add this to oh, the show yeah, notes. Awesome. Yeah. And and so the, the the plot of this again, we're not going to spoil it all, but uh, there is no flying lionfish. It was uh, it was an escapee from Josebiah Bentham's circus uh, that wanted to that was trying to get away because they they hated it, and the escapee was the orangutan. Yeah, Bathsheba. Bathsheba, Bathsheba which is weird because Bathsheba was an historic character. Uh, yeah. a, a story character. Well, it's a it's a biblical biblical character. Uh, it was the daughter of Iliam, one of David's thirty. So she was she was a queen of Israel, uh, Bathsheba. And here, uh, Bathsheba is an orangutan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, that, so again, the, the 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 big flourishing biblical names that yeah. Clyde Barker sometimes would get, and he would turn it into something completely different. So so Bentham and his circus show up uh, and are banging on the door, and they're trying to hide Bathsheba, and uh, and it doesn't quite work out, and they end up running away, and they get chased. And and what's funny is Josephiah Bentham, instead of having a giant ibis bird pulling the 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 cart or pulling the their their circus. They have yeah. a giant armadillo. Yeah, that's a pretty cool image. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so, I guess. And he we, talks too. Yes, yeah, and of course, he, like every other animal, he talks. And and uh, and and Maximilian Bacchus comes up with a plan uh, to to get rid of them, and it's it's hilarious. The plan is, and actually, I posted a quote uh, on. I posted a quote from from there when he he meets with up with a pirate. Uh, that mm-hmm. he sort of involves in his plan, and I posted this quote on Facebook that I thought was hilarious, it, it, because um, because Maximilian Bacchus was insulting him without him even figuring out that he was being insulted. Yeah. Um, what was that? Uh, yeah, it's like, are you calling me a clown? And uh... or don't make a fool of me. Yeah. Uh, and he says, "Can I make the ocean any wetter?" Right, and he says no. Well, there you go then. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're just paraphrasing, but it's yeah. yeah. It's it's he's obviously taking the piss out yeah. of the part. And, and, and it's funny again. His name is Hent, the the pirate. Right, right. And they're heading, and again they're heading to the he, Arctic to steal ice. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least they're not selling fridges to to Inuit people. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, that's, that's a really funny way they 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 find they come up. Blah, blah, blah. It's a really funny way they come up with to uh, uh, lose Dr. Joseph Bia Bentham is yeah. that, of course, they're being followed because they want their orangutan back. The orangutan has defected into uh, Maximilian Bacchus' circus. But then he realizes that when he sees the pirates, he realizes, oh, this is my chance. And he actually knew the pirates. So, yeah. again, I'm not trying to spoil anything, but he finds a way to trick them into thinking the orangutan was in the boat. And... Yeah. Uh, and the, the the theater of tears all follows uh, <laughs> into the boat of the pirates, and then they sail away. Except for the and, armadillo, and they're like, "Oh, we're sorry, armadillo, you don't have a circus anymore." And he's like, "Oh, that's okay, I'll just take a nap." Yeah, <laughs> and then and then Clyde Barker lets us know that the armadillo was taken care of yeah. because the people would bring him milk and shrimp. <laughs> so <laughs> I like the way he he sets the reader at ease. Like, oh, don't worry, because the next, you know, yeah. sometime after this, the people they <laughs> got a liking to the armadillo, and they even brought him milk and shrimp, and they called him Piers. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, okay. So I guess the armadillo isn't going to starve yeah. to death. And the next uh, story is my favorite: uh, how the clown Domingo de Ibarondo fell over the er- edge of the world. And that's yeah. the shortest out of all the titles. Um, yeah, this this is the one where the clown turns into a hero. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a pretty cool chapter. You know, the, he calls them stories, but actually this is like a whole story broken in four pieces. Yeah. Um, it, again, it goes to it, – it feels like the old like serial thing that yeah. you know a little piece of a story would come out. And it definitely and people... could have gone on. I mean, there's there's nothing that could have stopped him from writing more of these and just to keep and making it a bigger book. Uh, because oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah. I would love to to see like a sequel to uh, Doctor Maximilian Bach. Yeah, yeah. Why not? And and maybe yeah. if of course we talked about this earlier that there um, that a company um, bought the rights to make an animated version of Maximilian Bacchus, and I think uh, Mark Miller wrote the script for that. 
Uh, oh, okay. So if that happens and it's successful, maybe we would see more. You know what I would like to see? I would like to see this turn into animation mm -hmm. that would be like, uh, like, what do you call it? Kind of animation where they animate like, uh, paper figures, like paper cut oh, figures. Oh yeah, yeah, I see. What you yeah, mean. I think this would be amazing if they did it that way. Like, it would, it would even give more to the whole feeling of a fable, like something that you'd see unfolding on a wall yeah. or something like that. Uh, that, yeah, that would be really nice. I, I, I hope that this project goes. Uh, to completion and uh, we will be able to see the cartoon someday. Yeah. Uh, so in, in, in this one, um, they park their car and it's all fog. They they park for the night and it's all foggy. They're like, Oh, there's a town we should stop here and, and, uh, and get these people to see our circus. It's been so long and we've traveled a long time without getting to perform. And everybody was kind of depressed, especially Domingo de Barondo. And yeah, because, because they're, they're still on the road to Xanadu, but they, yeah. They're taking a lot of time to get there, and so they're getting a little, they're getting a little miffed because they're not performing, and they're, yeah. they they're getting really bored. And even like, Doc, and even Mr. Maximilian Bacchus's leaves on his beard and hair are kind of wilting away. Yeah. And uh, I guess it, it it shows that they need the uh, performance to have their the, their lifeblood, you know. Yeah. Like so. And it turns ultimately, out that this town is on the edge of the world. Yeah, and so then the, the next day when yeah, when they, they when the fog lifts, they discover they park their their caravan like like really close to the edge of the world. So the world is flat in this universe. Yeah, 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 it is. And and they've talked about that it being the world being the flat Earth and stuff. Um, and and so they try to go into town to, to convince people to come see the circus, and nobody will come out. And and everybody's got their doors shut and their their doors are all boarded up and stuff and it's like well, come on, don't you want to see the circus? Um, yeah, and and what they discover is that there are trolls who live down uh, who live down the the cliff of the edge of the world because they've been banished from the earth uh, from walking on the on the face of the earth, and these trolls will will come out at night and steal their children. Yeah, and place their own offspring in their cots. Yeah, and and uh, and who does that remind us of? Uh, cuckoos. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I don't say Rawhead Rex. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. in fact, one of the trolls' name is Rawhead. Oh my goodness! Really? Yeah. I, wow! I, I wow! That's They're, that's awesome. The trolls I are Ulock, Asher, Solomon, Wind and Weather, Rawhead, and Bloody Bones. Man, there you go. That's a really that's really well spotted. That is really well spotted. Wow. So I think this is kind of an early... I think that this Rawhead character got uh, got adapted later into Rawhead Rex. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. Wow. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. I'm looking at it right now. That's awesome. That 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 is great. You know, you see these, these these little seedlings in, like, Clive Barker's original work that would turn into other things further down the line. That's just amazing. Yeah, really cool. I, I I was excited to read that. I think that's probably why this is my favorite story. And and uh, and I just like monsters. And this is the you know this is the one with the monsters in it. But yeah, here it is. Pull, pull luck. Pull, Asher. Solomon, bend your back. Wind and weather. Pull, pull. Rawhead and bloody bones commands. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, rawhead. There you go. And and the, the, they're really weird creatures. They are described as having um um these um iguana tails yeah, and uh and boar tusks and boar tusks yeah and then uh, you can see if you have the book you will see the uh, illustration from uh, uh richard t kirk yeah it's really it's they're really strange creatures yeah. and uh, oh uh, and on the on the back of uh, back cover um or actually the front cover when you see maximilian falling and all the trolls are reaching at him around the borders oh thank yeah. you <laughs> Joey just handed me a rubber dinosaur. Okay, watch out for trolls. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow, and a pacifier and a dog. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, th this it, it's a chapter that something really dramatic happens. Uh, but again, yeah. Clyde Barker doesn't doesn't make us feel too bad for too long yeah. because uh, the trolls do come out while the circus is attracting people to watch their performance. 
And actually, I think Maximilian Bacchus at, at first thinks, oh, they're afraid of trolls. I can't believe it. Yeah. He actually likes laughs and makes fun of it. But then it turns out the trolls do come out, and yeah. they do see his caravan. They're like, oh, let's push this thing over the side of the world. <laughs> yeah. And uh, while they're busy doing their performance. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, uh, the guy who keeps them from doing that is the clown. And the yeah. clown is like, oh, no, they're, they're pulling our cart. And he, like, rolls, rolls onto them with his blue ball, yeah. throwing <laughs> oranges at them. Yeah. It's, you know, but, you know, something happens and, uh, you know, the chapter is a good spoiler, the chapter name. So he does fall over the edge of the world. Yeah. And, and actually I had forgotten, I hadn't read the whole, I hadn't read this since it first came out. So I'd forgotten yeah. what happened and I was worried, you know, as I was reading this, I was worried, oh no, is, is, you know, Domingo going to die? I, I <laughs> yeah. couldn't remember. Yeah, but you know, uh, it's worth it's worth not spoiling how he escapes. Yeah. Uh, but this does help help them uh, find their way to Xanadu and to Kublai Khan. Yeah. Uh, because they become pretty famous after this this daring rat of the Burundo. Sorry, we've got a singing toddler. <laughs> Do you want to take a few minutes? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Before we go on to the next chapter. No, I was just saying that this might be a nice story to tell Joey in installments when he grows up a little more. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a good idea. Yeah. Although he probably is going to want you to tell the whole story at once. Yeah. Yeah, right. Right now we read him like three books before he goes to bed. So what uh, do you want to do again, the the last part we were talking, or do you want us yeah, just to continue? Yeah. So, um, so then the last part is how Mr. Maximilian Bacchus' traveling circus reached Cathay and entertained the court of the Khan called Kublai in Xanadu, how they sought the bearded bird, and how at last Angelo was lost. That's pretty much the whole chapter on the title right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's really no room for surprise after yeah. you read the title. Yeah. Um, yes, they do arrive to Cafe. I think, if I recall correctly, uh, after the end of the last chapter, and they become really famous because of the clown, yeah. I think that there's like a guard or something that rides up to them and tells them to yeah. to go to the Palace of Xanadu. And uh, because they, they, they've seen what happened uh, in the sky, no spoilers. Yeah. And so they want, they want to know more about their circus. And uh, he takes them to... Uh, Xanadu, which is on the mountaintop, right? Yeah. And there was like seven walls, and each wall is better looking than the next. And, you know, they do that so people won't be overwhelmed if they just went straight into the city. Yeah. So they have to go, like, they have to cross all seven doors. And at each door, they go like, whoa, look at that. That's yeah. awesome. And then the next door is even more mind-blowing. And then they go like, oh. And then finally they enter the city. Yeah. And, and it's such a fantastic place that even they, even though they have snow and they have like cold and they're on top of a mountain, they once broke a piece of the sun and put it on top of the palace. So they always have sunlight, <laughs> yeah. which would help in some areas in Alaska, I guess. Yeah, that, that would be nice in the winter time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so Kublai Khan, they're, they're, I think they're arranging the circus, right? But they haven't actually performed it yet. Right, because uh, they meet the court. They meet Kublai Khan in the court, and then uh, Maximilian wants to personally greet everyone, shaking their hands. So it takes hours for this to go on. Yeah, and uh, and Angelo meets the princess, and he they fall in love with each other. Yeah, like right there. I mean, yeah. like in a second. Mm -hmm. As soon as they see each other, it's like love at first sight. Yeah. Which is another, you know, fairy tale kind of cliche, but and and it so it turns out Kuyuk, the emperor's brother, the Kublai Khan's brother, uh, so somebody put a bird mask on him, and now he believes he's a bird. Yeah, there was like a witch that uh, like cursed him and said she was going to turn him into a bird, but it turns out that she didn't have the power to turn him into a bird. So what she did was, she just did some practical effects on him while he slept, and she kind of put a. A bird mask on his face. Yeah. And when he woke up, he was like, oh, what? I'm a bird now? Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess I'm going to go crazy. Yeah. And uh, he went into the caves. He's like, he's like, oh, I'm a freak now. I'm a man bird. So he's just he just went into the caves. Yeah. 
and he became almost kind of like insane. So, uh, so he's been kind of a scourge on the on Kublai Khan and all these people because they don't want to fight him because he's his brother. But he, uh, um, I don't know what he does, you know. But uh, but everybody's kind of scared of him. Yeah, basically, uh, at first they tell the circus that he's dead, that his, his the king's brother is dead, and uh, the the princess is actually the king's brother's uh, daughter yeah. or the king's niece. But uh, so, oh yeah, her dad died, so she can't marry anyone. And he looks yeah. at Angelo when he says that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's not very subtle at all. Yeah. It's like, don't get any ideas, kid. Yeah. You know, she's in mourning. Her dad's dead. But then they realize that her dad is not dead when he shows up and he steals like a piece of the sun that's on top of the castle. Yeah. And everybody is in darkness and everybody goes kind of crazy because they're like, oh, no, it's night. What is this? It's dark. We've never seen this before. And it's cold. Yeah. And it's cold. And it's like in the confusion, uh, uh, the man bird actually also kidnaps the princess. And that's when they realize, oh, wait, so that guy was the uh, crazed uh, brother of the king yeah. who thinks he's a bird now. And he took his daughter yeah. to warm his heart and uh, the son to warm his cave, I guess. So there's a secret entrance down into the cave and the, and the, the circus people agree to go find him and, and, uh, and get her back. And I, which, is, which is the weird thing is none of the guards and, and uh, nobody else wants to do it. So it's like, yeah, hire the, let's get the circus people to do it. But uh, but yeah, yeah. They, they have kind of adventures going through the the caves to get to uh, to get to the Birdman, and we don't want to spoil the ending. Right, but let's just say, of course, as 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 it should be. Not only does this fable start with a wedding, it also ends with a wedding, yeah. which. Nice bookend thing, you know. Yeah. Start with a wedding, end with a wedding. Well, and, and Angela uh, was the replacement for uh, for the bird lady, uh, for Indigo Murphy, and now Angelo's getting married. So it's like they always are going to have one person that stays with them for a little while and then gets married. Yeah, and there's more than one reason why Angelo remains in Xanadu. Not just because, you know, the princess, but also because of another thing that happens. And he he fits Xanadu perfectly with his talent that we did not spoil. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So uh, it 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 does all the pieces fall together at the end, and it's everybody is doing what they should and being where they are where they should be. Yeah. So it's really nice. And like you said, I wish that the story could just as well continue. I mean, yeah. it, you know, there could I'd be love to see more of these of these stories. Um, I think that would be great. Yeah, they're very flourished. Uh, which, you know, is a sign of, like, an author's early work is always very flourishy and stuff. But uh, it works very well. I like this stuff a lot. And if you read this one, you should also, like, get Clyde Barker's first tales because I think they will they will uh, go very well. Yeah, they, they will complement each other very well. And that, like that the, would, that, if you put Maximilian Bacchus with, together with first tales, that's... That's every every uh, all of his early unpublished stuff, as far as we know. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's got a lot of un short stories and things along the way since he's been published that he's written that just haven't gotten published yet. But these were his main works that didn't get published until recently. Yeah. So it's it's a very beautiful book. The illustrations by Richard T. Kirk are amazing. Yeah. Um, I have the little. Uh, hardcover. I think it's signed. I think yeah. it's a little signed hard hardcover. I don't have it with me right now. It, it's 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 in another virtual. place. Yeah, I have that yeah. one too. Mine is uh, mine is the um, number one twenty of the three hundred. Uh huh. The signed uh, signed with the with the slipcase. Mm hmm. I think mine is number seventy something. I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Don't really remember right now, and before this came out, I also got an uncorrected uh, copy of this from Roy of Man Bo Bad Moon Books. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, he once posted something. He's like, "Hey, does anybody want any uncorrected proofs?" I was like, "Oh, I want one." And there was so, a short time when the Kindle edition was free. Yes, I also have it on the Kindle. I, I I jumped at that opportunity and yeah. I got it on my Kindle Cloud app. And, and this time so, I this time I I, uh, I read it on the Kindle instead of the hardcover. And, That's funny because I did the same on my phone. Yeah, and it was um, it was kind of nice reading the the Kindle version, and 
there was the you know the last title how long it is uh i could not when i would switch on the on the ipad when i would switch between between reading on the on the uh the kindle app and and my evernote i could yes. not remember all the title of between switching between those two apps so it's <laughs> yeah. like all right fine and i did a screenshot of the title and st- and pasted it in Right. It's really funny that at the end of the book, there is a section about the author, and the mm-hmm. section about the author says, Clyde Barker wishes he had a circus. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's all the, the, yeah. the about the author page that yeah. you can see. That's cool. So that, that that's pretty cool. And, and um, I think this is great. If you like Weave World, uh, I think that you'll like Maximilian Bacchus and his traveling circus. Yeah. And uh, David Niall Wilson has a little afterword also in the book. It's a little section called The Worlds and Worlds Between the Tracks. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me go back. The Worlds and Words Between the Cracks. That's, that's what it's called. Mm. So um, it's, it's a little, like, essay about this. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, that's right. I, and I read that, too. Um, and it was... It was kind of neat because he talked about uh, he talked about why fantasy shouldn't be too grounded in reality, and he talks about horror fiction and and and, and horror movies, and you know why something like uh, something like Hostel is you know the difference between something like that that you know that's depressing because it could really happen versus a fantastical kind of a horror story. Absolutely, yeah. and he also mentions the same thing we we were talking about that we. Uh, we think it's a little too short. We wish we could see more. He says, yeah. I came away from the adventures of Mr. Maximilian Bacchus and his traveling circus with a familiar ache. I have felt that same ache in the past at the end of works like The Lord of the Rings or Stephen King's Dark Tower books mm. or when Neil Gaiman's novel Neverwhere ended with so much promise of something more. I felt this same ache at the end of the last two or three novels by Mr. Barker that I had the pleasure to read and I felt it in this book. I want the story to continue. Yes, yeah. that's exactly what we feel like yeah. after we read this, especially because it's such a short book, and, and it's you know, so character driven. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You fall in love with these characters because they're just so, you know, they they have so much personality, and even though it's a short story, you know, Malachi. Ophelia, Hero, Maximilian Bacchus, even Doctor Josebiah Bentham. Yeah. They're just so well created and so well fleshed out. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's a testament to Clive's talent. And I, and I think that in a lot of other Clive Barker stories, the characters are in second place to the to the world. You know, to to um, the the characters are a way of opening up a world and and, and sure. exploring a world. And I think in this, it's the other way around. The world is only there to serve these characters. Absolutely, that's yeah. a great point right there. I mean, in this one, these characters create the world these characters change the world around them yeah. uh like like the clown and you know dr maximilian bacchus he he actually changes the world more than you know would be imagined when yeah. he talks to the pirate and the pirate recognizes him he says oh no not you again <laughs> you know the last time you were on my boat you were making like vines grow out of the mast of my ship and stuff like that <laughs> yeah. and i was like yeah so it does seem like maximilian bacchus is like yeah the Bacchus of Greek mythology taken to an extreme, like mm-hmm. Max Bacchus. And uh, he has this telluric, you know, he controls these telluric forces and magic, and he has this magic staff. It's kind of like a Gandalf if he had, like, a sideshow. Yeah, yeah, uh, he's he's fearless and ageless. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the idea we get from this guy. There's a funny moment as well. He's very witty. Not just a section where he insults the pirate without him realizing it, but another part where they're in the cave, they're trying to rescue the princess, and um, they manage to stretch out a wire between uh, two banks of a river. Mm-hmm. And and uh, some of the troop crosses the wire, especially the trapeze artists and the, uh, the, the clown. But then uh, Mr. Maximilian Baca says, oh, I can't do that. My feet are too small. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wait, no, he says, my feet are not big enough. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. what he says. <laughs> oh, uh, unfortunately, I can't cross the wire. My feet aren't big enough. Yeah. Which you know, it's 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 funny. it's a, another witty thing of saying, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and another part where a hero is carrying uh, Mr. Maximilian Bacchus on his shoulders, and um, it was mentioned earlier in the story how hero could carry like six bulls on his shoulders without even like raising a hair. 
But when he's carrying Mr. Maximilian Bach, uh, the narrator says, and, and this made the bulls look like pebbles. <laughs> Yeah. Again, showing that Maximilian Bach is a really corpulent character, very yeah. you know, very imposing, yeah. and uh, booming voice and all that. So, yeah. <laughs> he also scares away the trolls on the edge of the world with a whip. Yeah. So he's also kind of a badass. Yeah. Yeah, he he's a lot like Gandalf. Yeah, yeah. yeah I could I could see him like tell the trolls like, "You shall not drag my caravan into the edge of the world." Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that caravan—it's got to be a lot heavier than you would expect because uh, in that in that that particular story, when they're trying to pull it back again, it takes a it takes all day and and all night and and uh, and you know all these people pulling on it. Yeah, you know what I visualize this caravan as looking. Uh, I imagine. Have you ever seen those movies, like those old Universal movies, where you have? Um, like House of Frankenstein and stuff like that. Like there's that caravan that's going and there's like a little door in the back and a few windows and there's like a horse and a place for the guy to sit and behind mm-hmm. the horse and, you know, like the gypsy caravans yeah, or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how I imagine it to be like everybody's sleeping in their little bunk beds inside and there's like chests with clothes everywhere and, you know, balls and utensils and stuff like that. That's yeah, how, that I, how I visualize it. And Mr. Maximilian Bacchus sleeps in his wicker chair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it was kind of sad when you get to the end of this book because you kind of wish that it was longer. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in knowing what this Dolly story is that's going to come out and turn down the lights from yeah. Cemetery Dance. I don't, I'm not sure if you mentioned this uh, in the news. Um, but uh, I think we did last time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but but yeah, Cemetery Dance is a is an anthology, um, or or Turn Down the Lights is an anthology by Cemetery Dance, and and Dolly is an original Clive Barker story that's appearing in it, and you can pre-order you know, that book right now, and it's going to come out in January, I think. Right, but do you know anything about this story? Have you ever heard anything about this? Because uh, I, I I'm completely a zero on this story here. I I just oh I just read something about. Something about it on Revelations. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, something to do with the consequences of of uh, a man, uh, a husband beating his wife, and. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I, I the, it was pretty vague, which is good, fine with me because I want to, you know, I I want to read it. Sure. I, yeah. I want to know anything about it before I read it. Right. Yeah, I'm actually looking at the. Um... It's interesting because one of the stories in this anthology, uh, Turn Down the Lights, mm-hmm. is a story called Lukey Lou by Steve Rasnick Tem. And here's a funny thing that I've realized, and I think I've mentioned this to Phil and Sarah, um, and I'm going to bring it up now. Steve Rasnick Tem was back in 93, 94. I'm not, I'm not, I don't remember exactly when this was, but... Clyde Barker did this thing when he was uh, when his website was at the Kaleidoscope website. Oh yeah, and he did this uh, collaborative project that was called a uh, story with no title, a street with no name. Right. Okay, so one of the one of the contributors to this story, one of the guys who wrote like a second part to Clyde's first part, was actually Steve Rasnick Tem. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I realized that was, uh, I was looking at, I realized the name was familiar and I looked back and I was like, I think I remember this guy from the old Kaleidoscope collaborative fiction project. So I went back and I checked and it is him. It is the same guy. So apparently he was a fan of Clyde Barker's. He wrote this second part for that project, which never really got an ending. Hmm. But now like maybe almost 20 years later, here he is in an anthology right next to Clyde Barker. That's got to be interesting for him. That's yeah, got to be awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing that you spotted that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I wonder cool. what else he's done. I don't know. I, I, I only recognize his name when I looked at this anthology right now. There's, too bad there's no IMDb for writers. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, that would be useful. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so do you have any uh, uh, we, we listener We said feedback? one. Uh, Gregory says, uh, For my sins, I've not read this. 
didn't Clive write this in his teens? And the answer to that is not really. It's more like 21, 22 years old. Uh, where did the inspiration come from? Um, I think, I think, like you said, I think the inspiration was was Clive being kind of a a, a ringmaster for his plays. Right. Yeah. 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 There's there's a, a page on Revelations where you can read more about this. Yeah. And uh, we will add that to the show notes. Mm -hmm. Here's the link. Oh, okay. And he says, how uh, how much of an of an influence did his developing sexuality have on this and later works, but mostly this one? Uh, hmm. I I probably not a whole lot. I mean I mean it's part of him, so maybe a little bit, but it's. I think it has more to do with his his uh, his his obsession with fantasy. Yeah, I don't think there's any. This is very very safe for children, and by safe, I just mean that there's no, there's no, uh, there's none of that sensuality that he puts in other works. Yeah. This one is really just about you know wit and yeah. uh, cartoonish like characters, very safe children like fables. Yeah, I think yeah. I think that it would be. It's kind of you think of it like Aberad only less polished and with characters that are more, uh, um, what do you call that? Um, mythological? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Larger yeah. than life. Larger than life, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and a lot of, like, familiar names and places st thrown in the story, uh, which in, in later, you know, iterations like in Magica and Aberat, Clyde Barker would come up with his own original place names and stuff like that. But here he has, like, Xanadu, he has, like, Egypt, he has the River Nile, he mentions, Marco like, Polo. Glastonbury, yeah. <laughs> the Galapagos Islands, yeah. that you can actually go on a road. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. maybe it's not the real Galapagos Islands. Maybe it's a completely different place that just happens to be called Galapagos. Who knows? He says, but yeah. he says don't have a copy here. Got to find one on Amazon or maybe Audible. Um, yeah, Amazon for sure. You can get a Kindle edition. I don't know about Audible. I don't really use it. I mean, I've heard that the library is pretty awesome on Audible, but... I just no, I don't think I don't think there's an audio book of this on Audible. Oh, so otherwise I would Kindle and and it was even free at one time. I have no idea if it is right now. I kind of doubt it, but no, right now it's not free. But I think it, it can be pretty cheap. Uh, Maximilian Bacchus. I would definitely, yeah. If you can't get, I mean, I I think first place is the hardcover, you know, and second oh. place is the Kindle. Oh, hang on, I'm sorry. It turns out there is an Audible audio edition. Oh, okay. Well, there okay, you go. Well, so yes and we, yes. You can get we stand on corrected Audible on this. And on Kindle. And yeah, there's... probably, I don't know if you can buy the hardcover on Amazon because we all bought it uh, directly from the publisher when it came out as a special order. Uh, you can still Bad find it. Books. Can you? You can still find it. Yeah, like, for example, in Amazon, there's a $299 hardcover ah. that's available. I know. <laughs> it, well, it's double signed, yeah, well, so yeah, Richard so it's Kirk not just signed Barker. once. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, so that's the two hundred ninety nine dollar hardcover. Yeah, and so there were fifteen hundred signed trade editions. There were three hundred signed numbered slipcase copies, which is the one I have, and probably the one you have. Mm -hmm. uh, Twenty six signed lettered tray case copies, and ten signed ultra tray case copies. I'm not even sure those actually got finished yet because those were going to take a long time to finish i think oh, really the ultra ones yeah wow I, I remember something like a couple of years ago it was like oh we have the first two done so it's going to take a little while to finish the Out other ones 10? wow yeah i don't know i yeah, think I'm yeah happy with my, oh, they're probably all done I, I i usually don't go nuts and buy i don't buy like the 500 hundred dollar books but you know I yeah. think this was like 150 or something like that for the the limited 300 Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can still find it. There's a Kindle edition for four ninety nine on Amazon. There's a six ninety five Audible audio edition oh. on Amazon as well. And there's other formats, paperback, and of course hardcover. Yeah. Should we like add like a link to this? Well, yeah, just go yeah. on the realclybarkers dot com store, and you will find links there to buy it on Amazon. Yeah. If you buy it through Clyde Barker's store, you will be helping Clyde Barker. Well, in Amazon, Audible is part of Amazon, right? So. Right, Audible now belongs to Amazon. Yeah. Um, so he says, looking forward to this one too, guys. Thank you. So yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, 
those were all good questions. Uh, and we had a lot of other feedback, but it was all pretty much, oh, yeah, I have that book, but I haven't read it yet. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of the end of our, our feedback. My answer to those people is, why haven't you read it yet? Yeah, Go and read it. Yeah, yeah it's it's really quick read. I mean, it, you could do it in an evening if you had the time. I guess they're afraid of reading it too quickly and then being like, oh, it's over. I, yeah, I, well, that's the I only could, reason I would understand. I could, <laughs> yeah, I can, I can sympathize with that because you know when, like when, um, when between Abrat one and Abrat two, when all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden, Mister Be Gone came out. Yeah, and it's like, oh my god! And I read that in one evening, and it's like, oh, you know, I, yeah. mean, I really liked the book, but it was like, well, now what? Well, a little correction that I need to do about myself is that I I don't think it turns out I don't think that this book is on Clyde Barker's store uh, at all. Oh, okay. Uh, so, but yeah, just go on Amazon and you will find it. Yeah. Uh, and if you want a signed edition, your best bet is eBay. Or you can go on Bad Moon Books and see if you can still get something from them. Bad yeah. Moon Books. Um, I'll I'll find the website here. It's badmoonbooks.com. Maybe the the trade edition, the fifteen hundred. Maybe there's still some of those. Uh, unlikely, but you yeah. can check it out. Yeah, um, this was a big deal because this was the first, the first time that there was a limited edition of a story that had never been published before. Right? I mean, they 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 did the before that they did uh, the Hellbound Heart, which had been previously published but never in a hardcover. And, yeah. And then Maximilian Bacchus came out, and this was a limited edition of a story that nobody had read before, except for probably mm -hmm. you know people that are close to Clive Barker. So, right. So, so yeah. So now uh, you have Clyde Barker's first tales that are on sale right now. Yeah. So, again, it's a great compliment to this story. Yeah. Uh, so, if you already own Maximilian Bacchus, I would advise you to get the Candle in the Wind and uh, the Wood on the Hill because that would really make the the whole set come together. When, when you put these on your shelf, do you put them in order of when they're what year they're published or what year that he wrote them? Uh, usually my shelf, my Clyde Barker shelf, is on the order of when they came out. Okay, so Maximilian Bacchus you would put, like, in with the Aberrat books and stuff? Sure, yeah. Okay, I do it the way, in the order that he wrote them, so I've got, you know, it'll be, um, Maximilian Bacchus and then the Books of Blood and then Damnation Game, and, but I, but I put sure. the Aberrat books together and, and the, and I put, um... I put the books of the art together, even though there was uh, Thief of Always in between. Yeah, and, um, and Mr. Be Gone. Imagica actually came before Everville. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, uh, that's a good point, like the books of the art. Um, sure, I still I still put them on the order they, they came out. Yeah. But uh, some of them are not even on the same shelf, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it, now now you've got them in another country. Yes, for now, but you know, soon I'll have them here. Oh yeah, have you got a plan to get them back? Yeah, I'm working on it. That would. I am yeah, working on it. That'd be cool. That yeah. would drive me crazy. But I know you can't bring everything with you the first time. Around. I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, soon I'll be reunited with my Clyde Barker collection because it really is a part of me, and I really need it sometimes. And I find myself uh, buying double copies of books every once in a while on Amazon. Yeah. Like, oh, man, I really wish I had this book. Oh, here it is on Amazon. It just costs a penny. <laughs> oh, what the hell? I'll just yeah. get this one. I don't know. And, you know. Can, you, can you explain to me why uh, a bookseller would put a book on for sale for a penny? Yeah, uh, Goodwill. <laughs> sometimes it's, it's Goodwill uh, bookstores that are on Amazon. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes it's like, uh, it's it, like these deep discount stores that are like for charity like oh every book you buy like gets donation for like shelter for dogs or something like that you bit a penny i mean it's not even worth their time for that i know yes I, I don't know uh it is it is weird but i'm not complaining if i can get a a, a poseidon press weave world every copy i sold a book on amazon the, the the shipping that they quote is is lower than what i end up actually having to pay at the at the post office uh-huh so I, so it's like if, it, if a book is only like a dollar then i end up spending like three dollars 
Either. Yeah, like I, I bought books on Amazon. They're like a cent or 20 cents or a yeah. dollar. And then it's like four dollars to ship them to me, but I'm not complaining. I, yeah, I mean, cool. Yeah, I, I love bargains, so I'm willing to uh, to get a book that way. Like I said, I got myself a first edition of Cabal hardcover. Has a dust jacket. It's in good condition. It doesn't have any writing on it. It's not ripped. So, it's just a little yellowed out and just a little, you know, scuffed, a little scuffed from shelf sometime use. Sometime you and Sarah should make a trip to Portland and go to Powell's. I think I bought something from Powell's actually on Amazon. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, that is an amazing bookstore. I mean, I, I took pictures of the Clive Barker section when when we were in Portland for for oh. Nightbreed. Cool. But yeah, that so, that was great. That was the best yeah, bookstore I, I've ever seen. I got that book, that first edition of Cabal uh, from Poseidon Press. I got it for like twenty nine cents on Amazon. Oh, so wow. I know it's like, and it's in good condition it's not mint i yeah. mean it's a little yellowed out pages are a little yellow the dust jacket is a you can tell it's been you know it has some use yeah. but it's not ripped or anything it's it's in good condition so i was like oh cool 29 cents yeah i bought that to use for our episode when we discussed cabal because i bought the book and i was like reading it Yay. so yeah there's there's a lot of places out there that you can get cheap books online of course, nothing replaces the magic of actually walking into a bookstore and going through the shelves. I mean, I, I want to put this out there. I'm not advocating that, oh, you know, print is dead or that bookstores are going to, you know. Yeah. I, I much rather go into a bookstore any day of the week and choose my books and look at them than buying them online because sometimes we, you don't really know what you're getting. Yeah. Uh, and, it's and like, I, oh. Yeah, and they show you a picture of something that's different from what you get when you buy it. Um, yeah, like Hermione and the Moon. One, you know, that's there, there's another book that that story appears in called uh, Year's Best Fantasy and and Horror Volume Six. And so I went on Amazon to buy that, and I ended up getting Volume Sixteen. <laughs> okay, and, which didn't have that story, and it didn't have anything uh, by Clive Barker, and and I was yeah, and, you know, and it's like I only bought it for a dollar. Am I really gonna you know try to return? That's disappointing. This thing? Yeah. Right. So yeah, and after waiting, you know, for that to finally arrive, then I open it. It's like, oh, this isn't what I bought. Yeah. Well, sometimes that happens. That's why yeah. I would rather yeah. go to a bookstore. I love, any I love bookstores, I, and I, we've mentioned this before, but I miss the days of going to a bookstore and just going through the Clive Barker section to see if anything new came out. Um, that's never going to happen again, you know, because we are too on top of it, you know. No. Yeah. We, pre-order it and even yeah. get uncorrected proofs it's like oh yeah. i got the incorrected proof which by the way my incorrected proof from the adventures of mr maximum bacchus doesn't have any illustrations Aww. so that was a nice surprise when i got the actual yeah. hardcover later i could enjoy the book with the illustrations so I, I, yeah and i i gave away my uncorrected proofs of weave world because i don't know for me those aren't I, they're paperback and i they're just i i don't like them as much yeah, well, you know, they're they're just they're just a, a curiosity item for yeah. people who are really completists. You know, they yeah. go like, "Oh, I need to have this." Ultimately, I would love to have a manuscript. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Clive Barker manuscript. Oh, yes, please. Man. Uh, yeah, that would be tough. Um, for Ben Mears and Mark Miller, I feel for them having to read handwritten uh, manuscripts and manuscripts and type them because I could see that being slow going, uh, difficult yeah. process. I could see myself taking Xerox copies of every single page. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like uh, the Scarlet Gospels, a uh, nine thousand uh, page uh, manuscript. Oh, I'm just gonna like photocopy it real quick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. No. Well, ultimately, uh, you know, these things uh, we can't have everything. So I do have books that I only have like paperbacks. So, eh, you know, you, priorities. Sometimes you, you like something, but you need to save to buy something else. And uh, ultimately, you do the best you can to create the best collection you can. Yeah. Yeah, you have to you – have, I mean, nobody can have everything. So you just have, yeah. to admit, you have to decide what's important to you. Yeah. Well, I guess we, we did go on a little bit of a tangent here at the end of the episode. I, yeah. I'm not sorry, – sorry, guys, about us ranting about Amazon and online books and stuff, but – uh yeah, Maximilian Bacchus, great book. Read yeah. it. I yeah, thoroughly recommend definitely it. Definitely read it. I mean, I, I think it it stands up not just for Clive Barker fans. 
Um, Absolutely. Yeah, you but, can even read it to your kids. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it it's a, it would be a cool Wind in the Willow. You know, my, my mom read Wind in the Willows to me and, and uh, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings when I was a kid. Um, oh, and cool. So I would love to use this as that kind of a thing when Joey's only two, but when he's old enough to, you know, to understand what I'm reading him. Yeah, yeah, he's he's got his own Aberat copies from when he grows up. <laughs> yeah, they're all they're autographed and 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 personalized to him, and uh-huh. and, uh, and the Thief of Always too. Uh, you know, I always wonder if this backfires for parents sometimes because sometimes parents will say, "Oh, my son's gonna love this as much as I do," yeah. and then it's like kids grow up and they're like, "Ah, oh, dad, that's kind of lame." Yeah. So I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I'm really into Sega games too, and I really want him to be into you know the older console games. But I'm afraid he's gonna be like, "Oh, oh Call of Duty and." <laughs> yeah, Call of Duty Ten. <laughs> yeah. Zombie Nazis yeah. from Hell. Yeah, the, like the the Dude Bro games and stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay, wow. Ryan. Well, that's cool. And thanks to all the listeners out there yeah. who uh, you know keep supporting us. And uh, listening to our show. And that we've probably only got one or two episodes left for the year. We're, we're planning on one, but if another, uh, if another interview comes up, we won't turn it down probably. But, but probably just one more episode left for the year, and then we're going to start planning for 2014. Yeah. Can, can you imagine that? We started this in January of 2012, and right now we're doing, what, episode 60? That's, yeah. That's yeah, this is episode 60. That's crazy. Yeah. It's been a great ride, you yeah. know. Well, and next just... year, I mean, almost writes itself as far as what we're going to talk about. Because if you look at how many things are coming out. It's going to be a nice nice year for Clyde Barker fans and yeah. looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, well, I guess that's it for this episode. All right, awesome. All right, well, have a good weekend. You too. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Okay, one quick correction there. Uh, the story Dolly, I said that Cemetery Dance, uh, the Cemetery Dance anthology, Turn Out the Lights, was going to come out in January. Actually, we don't really know. I don't think that there's a date uh, it's just, other than 2014. So it's just sometime in 2014. Um, but they already have a cover and everything. I would imagine it's going to be, you know, closer than, or than, you know, closer to the beginning than the end. But who knows for sure. Bandwidth for this episode was provided by Craig Reese, a uh, loyal listener, great guy. He, li- he asks a lot of pertinent questions. Thanks so much, Craig Reese. We really appreciate the support. Uh, anyway, you can reach us on the web at www.clivebarkercast.com. We're on iTunes, so leave us a review there. We're on Podomatic, Xbox Music Store, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Double Twist, BlackBerry, and Pocket Cast. Uh, we're, we have a Facebook page, uh, join the Occupy Midian group on Twitter. We're at BarkerCast and at Occupy Midian. Uh, the forum is clivebarkerfans.com slash forum and theme by Colin Lakativa. Uh, 